And my name is New York Ron. All right, New York Ron, and you're visiting Binghamton. I'm visiting Binghamton. I always come through this town because it's a beautiful town as far as I'm concerned, especially pertaining to the railroads if you know what you're doing. And that's through experience over the years, making mistakes and getting caught. So as it turns out, you are a, a real railroad expert. When, when things happen on the railroad, whether it's in the Binghamton area or in much of the country, I mean, you, you know about things that, that are happening. You're, you're very familiar with the companies that run the railroads and the Excellent. history. Excellent. Excellent. Tell me a little bit about yourself and a and, uh, little background. Uh, you don't have to go into mm-hmm. excruciating detail, but a little background about your early years and then ultimately bring us up to speed how you are visiting Binghamton and how you occasionally do visit Binghamton. Tell, tell us uh, a, a little bit ab- about your story. This is a fascinating story, and I think our listeners are going to be very intrigued. Well, to start off, I was born in Massachusetts, but um, the first train ride I took was out of Albany, New York, on April 1st of 1966 with a girlfriend I had up there, her brother, and he's been riding since 1946. So he says, well, I'm going to go up to Buffalo and see a couple of friends and everything. He says, you've been on a train before? Ron? I said, never. He said, you want to go to Buffalo on a train? I says, I don't know, I'm kind of scared of riding a train. He says, I have plenty of experience. I said, well, we'll go for it. So next day I bought all my gear and everything, sleeping bag, backpack, good boots and everything. So he left his uh, sister's house, Sophia, and took the bus out to the, what's called it, a silk crook yard in Albany, which is about 8 or 12 miles from Albany. We got there, and he knew the yards by hand because he'd been riding since 46. So he says, okay, our train will probably leave in about two or three hours, so let's get over here in the bushes so nobody can see us. I said, sounds good to me. His name was Gino. I can't pronounce his last name. He's Italian. So our train came about two and a half hours. He said, this is the one right there going to Buffalo to the, to the frontier yard. He said, it's New York Central. I said, I realize that. He said, is this your first time on a New York Central train? I said, it's my first time on a train in my life. He said, I'm going to give you a name now. I said, what's that, Gino? He said, New York Ron. So that's how you got your name and the name that you've been known by now for decades. For 49 years. Wow. So you're riding the rails. Well, I've been riding the rails mainly, truthfully, I can't stand summer. reason why you get down these yards in the summertime all the employees can see you and everything. And some of these big divisions have cameras in yards and everything. Best time is winter time, even though it's cold, because the special agent, which is railroad cop, they call Bo. If he gets a report from the tower, there's a drift in the yard. I carry a scanner, a thousand channel scanner. I so you can monitor the the, ra- the radio frequencies, say that the railroads, uh, both the uh, people at the freight yards and, and the rail police are, are using, so you can kind of keep track of what they're up to. It does an excellent job. Say, if, say for example, if I'm in a yard here in Binghamton, which is Norfolk Southern and Canadian Pacific, okay, if they see me in the yard and everything, they're going to call the what's called a tower or the control center. All right, from that, my 1,000-channel scanner, I punch Norfolk Southern right into my scanner, the dispatcher, and also the special agent. So anything he says that there's a drift in the yard, I'll pick it up. Now, by the time the special agent gets there, by all means, I'm long gone. So it's kind of a cat and mouse game. I mean, you have to, to keep track of what's going on. Essentially, situational awareness if you don't want to be in big trouble and potentially be arrested for trespassing. Well, truth and honestly, I'll admit, I've been arrested probably around four times in 49 years trespassing. I learned my tricks from pros and everything years ago. And my mind's like a railroad. I've been in many newspapers all over the country and everything. And I'm... Um, I carry my scanner all the time because for years, Conrail, which started back in April of 75, after they took over th- uh, 13 railroads back east, they went bankrupt. The chairman was L. Stanley Crane in the headquarters in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Now, Conrail stands for Consolidated Railway, but in 95, Conrail went bankrupt, so they sold out. So, Norfolk Southern bought 52% of Conrail, stock and everything. And CSX bought 42% of Conrail. So there's no more Conrail yards. The yards that were Conrail are all changed and everything. So what do we have here? We've got two yards here in, in the Binghamton area, one a, a downtown Binghamton yard and one a little further east in Conklin. Those those are, what was there a, a DNH yard? Is that still the, operation? Uh, they were DNH back then, and they were Lackawanna back then before um, Conrail took them all over. 
but D and H sold to Norfolk Southern. Delaware Hudson. All right. So, what what happens? I mean, you mentioned you've been arrested about four times in nearly five decades of riding the rails. When when they finally do catch up with you, uh, I mean, are they are they all business? I mean, do they treat you okay? And or or I mean, and I understand you haven't been arrested recently. No, I'm very cautious. All right, but but the times you've been arrested, uh, how how was the treatment when when they they hauled hauled you in for uh, uh, riding on freight trains for free? Well, what they'll do is they'll arrest you. They'll call you the sheriff department if it's a small town, a big city. They call the city police department. And they come down and the special agent says, I want this man arrested for trespassing. So you're arrested, taken out of the police station, fingerprinted, mugshot and everything. And the gear you have, they go through it very cautiously. Make sure you don't carry no guns, drugs or weapons or anything illegal. Then next morning, you see the judge and everything. And about 90% of the time, the judge will give you what you call it. Two or three days in jail. Then they'll tell you, when you leave here, don't go back down the yard. Because when you get stopped in any railroad yard, whether it's Norfolk, Southern, Bronx, Northern Santa Fe, CSX, they put you in their main headquarters computer. Say so they f- keep track of people that they've caught. Exactly. For example, if I got stopped here in Binghamton by Norfolk Southern and thrown in jail and everything, their main headquarters gets a copy on the computer. Now, if I got, now if I got caught in Roanoke, Virginia on a Norfolk Southern, they just punch my ID in the computer and bang, it comes right up. And they say, you never learn your lesson, do you? So you're going to take well, a after almost half a century, I don't think you're ever going to learn your lesson. <laughs> well, I have, um, I know all the spots to catch these trains throughout the USA. I've been every state except for Hawaii and Alaska. And the, and the best time to ride is in the wintertime. But the coldest state I've been to, believe me, over the years is um, Minneapolis, Minnesota. Well, I've seen some of their winters seem to be horrific. I mean, the winters around here can be bad, but I've I've seen in terms of, of snow and just brutal cold for sometimes uh, periods of several weeks that, that parts of Minnesota, Duluth, and mm-hmm. and other mm-hmm. places uh, are, are just horrible. Now, here's here's the thing. I, is it tougher these days to, to to ride the rails, say, in 2015 compared to, say, five or ten years ago? Are they making it uh, more difficult for, for people such as yourself and and like-minded individuals, I, I would say kind of free spirits who, who love America and get, get a chance to see more of America than I'll ever see? Uh, are they making it tougher for you to uh, to get, get on board? That's a very good question. For example, you take Burlington, Northern Santa Fe, which is bought. Well, isn't Warren Buff- Buffett now in charge of that? Warren Buffett bought the what's called Burlington Northern Santa Fe probably around 15, 16 years ago for 28 billion something million dollars. And he's out of Omaha. And um, he's a very respectable man because I read about him years ago in the Vita's Digest. He's, ve- he's, he's an amazing, an amazing individual, an amazing businessman and investor. I mean, not only does he have his uh, hand in, in railroads, but he also owns newspapers. He owns the Buffalo News. Brookshire, uh, Brookshire Hathaway. Yes. Yes, and and uh, every year when he has his big gathering in, in Omaha, I believe, mm. I don't know if it's hundreds or thousands of investors mm. come to, to hear him speak. They he's do. he's really, he's the oracle. Yes. Well, see, um, for example, now, um, the railroads now are extremely getting hard and harder to ride. Reason why, they're scared because of Al-Qaeda, because they haul a lot of tankers on them trains. Well, well including that, that uh, uh, Warren Buffett railroad, a, a lot of the... Uh, cars coming out of uh, where North Dakota that mm-hmm. are are hauling that back in crude and actually I'm wondering about that if you see a freight train well I don't know if they mix uh, the oil tankers with with box cars does that they happen do. sometimes they when do. there's a, a uh, th- sometimes they're calling those death trains because they have a propensity to blow up are you worried about those trains with with the box and crude well they call those trains a uh, mixed load of box cars grain trains tankers everything you know and um they ain't fast trains. Now, you take those twin packs, double stacks, or semi-trucks on, on trains, they call them hot shots. Matter of fact, to make an example clear, I rode out of Boston one time to L.A. twice in one month. Nine days up there, nine days back. Nine so you days traveled in, in that period uh, 6,000 or more miles by rail? Oh, easy. Yeah. Well, usually I used to keep track all the time of the mileage. I travel every year. Sometimes I travel 15,000, 20,000 miles. 
but one at a time, I love one at a time with a passion. The reason why, if the railroad dispatcher says I got a report there's a drift over near so-and-so track, I'll pick it up on my scan, and we call it a snitch box, because I got all the, I got every railroad frequency in the U.S. I was going to say, they're publicized, plus you can get them online or their frequency right, guides. Right, right. And uh, best time about one at a time, a railroad cop being going to get out of his car and go over this track and this track, try to find you was like, especially in Minneapolis or Minnesota, it was like 15 below zero and everything wind chill. He will just call and say, I checked, he ain't here now. Roger, 10 forward, keep an eye. You bet, know what I mean? Well, I would do the same thing. I wouldn't so have I. much incentive <laughs> to, to, to <laughs> take take out New York Ron when, when uh, the, the temperature's below zero and mm-hmm. probably the wind is going at, at 20 or 30 mm-hmm. miles an hour. You know, it'd be like I'd roll my eyes and say, it's not hurting anything. And here's, uh, here's something good for you. Warren Buffett, that billionaire, which I respect a lot, out in California, some of his guys, he has special agents with a canine dog and even pit bull in the highly trained. Now, if he sees you like 50 trains down, right, and he's, well, and he's driving to you in his car and everything, he says, get over here, right, and you flee, he'll let the pit bull out or the canine dog, you know, police dog, and they'll, they'll grab your leg and they'll hold you for him. But um, from what I gather, other roads like um, CSX, Norfolk Southern, Union Pacific, they're probably going to be doing the same thing. Well, that, that's going to make life tougher, I suppose, for you and, and the others who are, are trying to get transportation, whether you're going, say, from Binghamton. Where, well, okay, Binghamton, you're going to be here for how much longer? Do you? Oh, suppose? probably for another two weeks. All right. And, and by the way, where, where do you stay when you're in Binghamton? When I'm in Binghamton, if it's what's called the summertime, I'll go by a Salvation Army or Mission and get a good shower, clean up and wash up. Then go by the grocery store, buy some peanut butter, jelly, and beans. That's all I eat on the train. But I stay healthy. And then if I'm leaving Binghamton, which my next stop is going to be Chicago, the train will go exactly like this here. Norfolk Southern and CS, you know, CP, Canadian Pacific or Canadian National. They'll go from Binghamton up to, up to Gang, uh, Gang Miles. Gang small, Mills. Gang Mills, yep. a small town. Then from there, right, they'll drop off some grain trains and pick up another load. And then from there, they'll go right up there to Buffalo. Uh, when I get to Buffalo, if I'm on the Norfolk Southern, I'll stay on them. Because when he leaves Buffalo, you've got to be careful with your skin and understand it. He'll go from Buffalo to change crews next in Cleveland, Ohio, to Collinwood Yard. It used to be Conrail, but it's still the Collinwood mm-hmm. Yard. Then from there, he'll go up to Elkhart, Indiana. It's a big division with a hump where the trains go up. And they go down, and the guy in the tower has electrical controls on the computer. We want that train to go. I've been to some yards with like 68 sets of tracks going across. And when that train goes up the hump right there, they get a thing called a yard dog. It's an engine, but it's a flat engine, flat in the front. When it goes down the hump, the 68 tracks there. The guy gets on the computer, and the tracks it may go that way, that way, or that way. So you have to be careful. Have you had any close calls? Oh, I've been to two derailments years ago. But you were I, on a train that derailed. I've been on two of them. Were you actually in one of the box cars that went off the tracks, or, no. or were you fortunate that the the cars that actually derailed were were not? Uh, you were safe, not involved. It's a safe pop. When you ride a freight train, always try to ride way in the back. They don't use caboose no more. They took them off the track over 20 years ago. They put a light on the back. The railroad guys call it a Freddy, but the real name for it is a telemetry light. They tell the pressure, the gauges, and everything to the engine. That's why they stopped using cabooses. We're talking with New, New York Ron. Uh, he, he was born in Massachusetts. Uh, he's been riding the rails now for about half a century. How old are you? 66. Right. started when I was 17. Really? 17. What was the fascination initially as a teenager? What got you interested in in railroads. I know a lot of rail buffs, but I That's a good you're, question. The, you're the first one I've met who's taken it to this extreme, and I know you're not alone. There are a lot of others who, who mm-hmm. do the same. It's just unusual that that uh, you know some some uh, radio reporter in Binghamton has a chance to encounter someone. And, and in fact, I was uh, taking pictures of of the the rail yard, and, and you were providing a lot of information about the trains. So what compelled you to, to get so interested in trains to begin with and, and a, adopt a lifestyle that, to say the least, is highly unusual? That's a good question. When I was young, probably around 17, no, when I was young, probably around 12 or 13, I used to love model trains. 
I had a good set at one time at my mom's house down the cellar, and I was fascinated with trains, and I got kind of hooked on them. I cannot get no driver's license because I have epilepsy, nowhere in the country, but I got a well control with the medication and everything. Then when I'm, I met Gino, my girlfriend Sophie's brother, he said, come on, let's go for a ride up to Buffalo, I'll take you up there. So the next day we went down to the surplus store, army surplus store, I bought all the gear, backpacks, sleeping bag, all that stuff, and it was summertime of all times. So his sister Sophie gave us a ride out to the Silkirk yard in Albany, which back then in 66 was New York Central. And so he said, well, our train will be in about two or three hours. He came about two and a half hours later, and he said, well, since you're riding to New York Central, I'm going to call you New York Ron. How's that sound? I said, that sounds good to me, Gino. That's why I got the name New York Ron. What do you do for health care? Health care? I do a lot of exercise all the time. I'm extremely good shape for my age and everything. But what happens if you get really sick or if you get hurt? Uh, down a railroad yard, I'm cautious, just like the FBI is. You know what I mean? Very cautious. And main thing, um, you can watch these tracks in the wintertime when you cross over them because it's snowed in sometime and you can slip. But um, wintertime, I always wear gloves all the time. But summertime, I got off trains moving up to maybe 10, 12 miles an hour. And I like that TV crap. You see guys running and grabbing trains. But don't you get hurt? And I mean... I, I suppose if you get used to doing it, there's there must be an art to doing it so you can oh, l- land with without uh, getting really bruised or, or, for that matter, getting broken bones. What I'll do, I'll look out the door when he's coming to the main yard because I'm usually way in back of the train where he used to put the caboose five back as I could go. And I see him slowing down because I know there's a railroad cop, maybe two of them down there just waiting for that train to come in. Sometimes you got one on one side and one on the other side. When the engine's into the yard and everything, and when they go, they break off the three or four or five engines, whatever, whatever they desire. Then the railroad cops will ride down both sides of that train right there in the cars real slow. So down the back of the train, I'll drop my handbag off real slow and my backpack, and I'll see them tumble over like this. Then I'll grab the side of the train right there, and I'll run with it. When you run with it, run that way on the right if you're coming in the yard. You may tumble over a few times, but I always wear gloves all the time, even in the summertime, because I'm... Um, you get your hands scuffed up on the rock sometime. And then you grab your gear right away and get your butt out of sight and out that yard as quick as you can for your own safety. All right. What, uh, you told me that y- you know that you're uh, in, in a couple weeks, actually I think it's less than a couple weeks, you're, you're heading to Iowa. What's, what's going on in Iowa? I already have a thing every year. It's been going on since 1900 called a hobo convention. What they do is... Um, Five guys can sign up for king, or five ladies can sign up for what's called a queen. They run for the title. How they do it is um, the five guys that ran for king, they screen and see if they're, you know, telling the truth or not. Now, the guy that screens them has a lot of knowledge. He can tell if they're flim-flamming. If he thinks they're flim-flamming, he'll just cross them off the list. All right, I screened one time, five guys. Two guys, I said, where are you from, by the way? And I caught them in all kind of lies, blah, blah, blah. And three were telling the truth. So you go on a stand in front of thousands of people. In front of, the, in front of them thousands of people, they have a guy in each corner, right, left, right, left, with a little digital machine for clapping. Uh, when you go on a stand there, you're going to tell your life story in 15 minutes. Then when that's done, a buzz will go, bop. Then, then your life story's uh, done talking. Then all the people in the crowd start clapping. All right, when them three get through what's called telling their life story and everything, and the clapping ends, they have these four guys with those little computer meters. They go in the tent, and they match all the sound on it for number one, number two, number three. Which, 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 whichever one of those one or three got the most clapping is initiated as a new king of hobos for one year. So uh, have you ever won? Uh, they asked me quite a few times to run. I said, no, nah, I'll stick with my title. Back in um, 1987, when I got to Brit, Brit, Iowa first time, I met an old timer there. He's pretty famous all over the country. His name was Steam Train Murray Graham. He's been riding trains since what's called the 40s and everything. And he's been king five times. He said, I heard a lot about you, New York, Ron. I said, yeah, I, I bet you did. He so said, are you a legend in, in these circles? Something uh, of a legend? Oh, quite a few places I am. <laughs> Here's don't take this the wrong. Who who is Boxcar Willie? 
Box Cowbelly, let me tell Was he you. just a singer? or no, what, let, me, what, what, let me tell you about Box Cowbelly. I got a letter from him one time years ago. He was a singer down in Nashville, Box Cowbelly. He wasn't no real hobo like the people say. Okay, well, know? I didn't think he really was. No. I thought it was all like shtick. No, he used to sing hobo songs. Right, I, I remember the songs, and I, right. I, I never paid attention to his background, but I figured, no. you know, it's something... Uh, resonated at one point, and he thought, "Well, I'll adopt this as as a name." And mm -hmm. and I mean, everybody has a gimmick. Mm -hmm. I mean, mm -hmm. uh, Taylor Swift, for example. Right, I mean, right. she's got her gimmick, but Boxcar Willie had his. Right, right. Now he wasn't a real writer in real life. He was a singer. He sang them hobo songs and everything. He was out of Nashville. He died probably around probably around 18 years ago. He wrote me a letter one time years yeah, ago. Yeah, you're right. He died. Uh, according to this, he died in in 1999. So uh, yeah, great yeah, night. Well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're, you're, so, but you, he wrote a letter to you? Yeah, years ago he did. Box how well he. Matter of fact, I got the letter at my um, sister's house down in Massachusetts. Yeah. How often do you see family? Well, I see family parlor two or three times a year. Really? Yeah. Do you try to return home at all for, for any of the holidays? I mean, do you try to get home, say, for for Christmas or New Year's or Thanksgiving, or, or does it depend? Uh, I got rabbit at my feet all the time. Yeah. I go home sometime. I still, matter of fact, maybe a week or two. And my sister must say, where are you going to send back on the rails? Do you want to stay long? I said, you know what I do all the time. So yeah, we know what you do all the time. <laughs> what does she think of that? A, a brother who's been riding the rails since he was 17. It amazes them. They say, you're lucky you ain't dead yet. Like they just had a hell of a collision down in, Pen down in Philadelphia, the Mam tracks. Yes. It was really, really serious. It was. And, and the, the thing is, I mean, and, and not that long ago, there was another serious passenger train crash down in New York City. In both cases, the, oh, yes, the trains were going way too fast. Right, right, right. In, in your experience, by the way, one of our listeners frequently calls, and, and he he's concerned because he thinks sometimes when uh, the freight trains are coming through this area that they're going way too fast. Do you think that, uh, based on your real-life experience over about half a century riding the rails, do you think that most trains are being operated safely? I think about 85% of them are because if they derail and the fumes come out them tankers and everything, right, some of the small towns will evacuate them to the fumes all gone and everything. They do it like that in North Dakota when some of them change derail in small towns. With the tankers yeah, sometimes they have to evacuate thousands of people, thousands sometimes of for people. a few days a after few days a serious derailment. Poison stuff in the air out. That's scary business. Would you recommend this lifestyle to anyone? Or I mean, obviously, it's right for you. And there, uh, as it turns out, are a lot of other people that, that uh, you normally don't have media access. I know you've mentioned you've had some write-ups in newspapers, but it's, Quite a few. you haven't been on the radio lately. No, I haven't. So uh, is, is this a lifestyle that, that you would recommend to anybody else? Uh, I mean, if if they love seeing America, and I mean, clearly I can't condone it because what you're doing is illegal. Well, put it this way here. If somebody's interested in riding trains to see in America, they can't just go alone and try it by themselves. They have to go to a person who has a lot of knowledge to tell them what to do and what not to do. But riding trains right now, these days, is getting harder and harder. There's so much security, and like I say in California, Warren Buffett and some of his guys, he got his special agents with police dogs or canine dogs, all highly trained. You know, if the so it seems to you that you're saying that the era of rail riding might eventually be coming to an end. Well, years ago, you had over a million people riding trains back in the Depression days, families and everything. But um, now, in my honest opinion, here's how I see it. I've been to so many yards and so many states over the years. I figure right now, study riders all the time like myself, I don't think there's 300 of them. Oh, really? Not I didn't really, uh, realize it was down to that because, low. Um, a lot of me tired because the railroad's getting more tight on security and everything. But my opinion, you want to ride a train, ride with a professional who knows, knows what he's doing. So don't don't just say you you heard it on the radio and think oh I can go out and and for because I I have nothing else going on say if I've got a, a week of vacation coming up you don't recommend me hopping aboard a train to because I've got friends up up in Portland Maine and just doing it myself without without somebody who can provide uh, actual a expertise. Here's a good one for you. Years ago when I was in a Silk Road out in Albany, probably around 25 years ago. I seen this guy under the bridge that goes over the yard. So I came out to the little hole in the fence right there, 
and he's just a real good. Brand new Levi's, good boots and everything, clean shaven, fancy North Face back, uh, 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 North Face backpack. And so he says, "I'm, um, where are you going?" He says, "Well, I'm trying to get to Chicago." He said, "You've been there before?" I said, "I've been there many times." And come to find out, you won't believe it. He was a, he was an orthopedic surgeon. Really? From a small town called Cohoes. Outside, outside of Albany. Right, outside really? of Albany, yeah. And he didn't tell me. So I said, yeah, I said, I'm going up that way. He said, well, can I go with you? I said, no problem. So I looked him over real good, clean shaven, hair all trimmed neatly and everything. His hands looked like snow and everything. And he had a, what's called a fancy um, Rolex watch on. I said, what kind of watch is it? He said, Rolex, I said, you put that out of sight. I said, a guy will kill you for a watch like that. He said, really? I said, really? He was a train buff for years since he was a kid, he told me, and he wanted to try it. I said, I will take one to Chicago. So I found it on my skin when that train's coming out of the Silk Crook yard, going up to Chicago. I said, just follow me. So he's walking on the tracks like kind of scared, you know? And we found a boxcar, so I jumped up and I said, give me your backpack. He gave me his backpack, then he gave me mine, then he gave me my handbag. And I said, no, come back in the corner right and stay out of sight and, because there's railroad police, Bulls, you watch these trains. He said, okay, I'll, I'll do as you say now. I knew he was a green on first time. So we rode from, matter of fact, Albany, all the way up to Chicago and everything. And we got off, matter of fact, in um, the Burlington Northern Yard, because when we got to Elkhart, Indiana, the Conrail, we got off, uh, the Conrail stops there, so we called the Burlington Northern that comes out of Cicero Yard in Chicago and brings the load over to Elkhart, Indiana, then Conrail takes over. And they also have... A so how much further, I mean, we've we're, uh, got the news coming right up, did, did he wind up doing much more traveling with you? Well, when I got to Chicago, Illinois and everything, the Cicero Yard, he said, is there a restaurant close by? He says, one way to cross the street there. So we went across the street there, and he said, order what you want. I said, oh, sounds good to me. <laughs> so I ordered steak and everything. Yeah. And he says, um, I said, what kind of profession do you do, by the way? He says, I didn't tell you before because I was scared. He said, I'm a medical doc, orthopedic surgeon. Yeah. So he gave me his business card, and he gave me a $100 bill. And he says, now I can tell my friends and everything I wrote all the way to Chicago. He was amazed. So it was a real-life adventure. So all the time we have uh, for today, I, I, I find it fascinating. I think I'm going to stick to Amtrak myself if I wind <laughs> up riding the rails. But New York, Ron, thank you for taking some time to tell us a little something that I, I suspect most of our listeners on Binghamton Now have never heard about. It's, it's fascinating to me. And I wish you well. I wish you well, too. Thank you so much, I need sir. a lot more information, but as you said, you have a certain amount of time. Yeah, I, I know. Unfortunately, we're out of time, but I appreciate your time today. And be well and enjoy the, the next few days here in Binghamton. I sure will. I like this town.